You guys just have to deal with me this morning, so I'm going to need your help. Here we go. Let's, uh, let's sing. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Crucifixion by his blood, I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is death's defeat. All praise, all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who. And is devil more will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me far beyond what. Hearts imagine, ears have heard, and eyes have seen. I believe that a day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. Like the altar, keep it burning. See the lamb who rose, the roaring lion. All praise, all praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit, our God is overcome. The King who was and is devil more will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe, I believe. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who changed my life? No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Sing all praise. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God is overcome. The king who was and is devil more will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe I'll pray. I'll pray to God the Father. I'll pray to Christ the Son. I'll pray to the Holy Spirit. Our God is overcome. The king who was and is In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. So I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. to Jesus. Let's sing that. All to Jesus I surrender all 
to Jesus, all to Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy God, let me feel the Holy Spirit true. Jesus, I surrender. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender, Lord. I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender. Surrender all, all to thee, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Call me out upon the water, great unknown, if grace. Die. 
I know who you are, the cross of salvation. I was made, cause I was made to be tended.
So why would I make bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours. I was made for more. Father, we were made for so much more. Father, we come before you this morning. And we recognize your greatness and your glory. Lord, and we just take this time to honor you and to give you praise. And it's in your son's precious name. Amen. Please be seated. As we uh, take the bread and the cup together this morning, let's take this time to um, just surrender ourselves before him and to recognize the sacrifice that was made through the body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed for our sins.
can you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 your good good father to you are to you are to you are and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Your good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. To I am. Amen. And please be seated. Good morning, all. How are you? Very good, very good. Uh, my name's Andrew. If you've not had the chance to meet yet, I'm one of the ministers here. Uh, just a few things in the way of announcements. Want to get us all on the same page on. Let everyone know how uh, you can kind of get best uh, connected over the next few weeks. First is, um, if this is your first time or one of your first times at Southwest, a particularly warm welcome to you. Uh, we would love to start getting to know you, and we invite you to do the same with us. Uh, one of the ways to do that is in the back of the bulletin. Uh, is what's called a connect card. You fill that out uh, to the extent that you are comfortable, that you want to. And then what you do with that is we have boxes uh, next to each set of exit doors, one, two, and three. There's a few things you can put in there, but the connect card is one of them. Put it in there, and then we'll start getting to know each other. But also, out in the lobby, there's a guest central of sorts. Uh, we would love to meet you kind of face-to-face -face and send you home with a gift. Um, so you're invited to that as well to meet us out there uh, after the service. Uh, next piece is in a couple of weeks, we are uh, offering... Um, it's just that time of year, a new small group leader training. We have a number of small groups, 20 plus small groups here at Southwest, and those small groups are led by small group leaders. Um, so it's our hope to kind of grow this ministry, certainly as more and more people are calling Southwest home, but that means like, oh, we need kind of more people in the pipeline who'd be comfortable essentially facilitating a group and conversation and lessons, things like that. So if you're like, hey, that might be me, even if you're like, hey, like, I don't know if I'll be ready to lead a small group in April or May, but maybe in the, over the next year, if that's you, like, hey, I would like to kind of have like to have those tools in my back pocket. I'd like to be kind of trained in this way. Mark your calendars for three Thursdays in a row. That's starting April 9th here at the building from 7 to 8.30, led by our Connection Minister, Rocky LaPrade. So more information in the bulletin, but mark your calendars for that if that sounds like you. Uh, next, well, we've been talking about it for a long, long time, but next weekend is Easter weekend. Uh, Easter is that Sunday where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, which sets our faith apart. Uh, as uh, we say at Southwest, without uh, a resurrection of Jesus, there is no reason for us to gather. So the resurrection of Jesus, that is where we put our, every bit of our hope in uh, the promise of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So we are obviously celebrating that. Four different services, um, certainly at uh, 9.30 and 11.00 next Sunday morning, but if you're like, you know what, uh, we could uh, maybe help some things out because, again, we're going to have six, 700 people across those four services, and space is a concern, which is a good concern. Um, but outside of that, um, uh, if you want to consider coming to the Saturday service, that would help out, but also, uh, if you don't have any kiddos, consider coming to the 8.30 uh, service as well, just to, again, serve in a, an indirect way, just create more space elsewhere, um, but love to have you there. And then uh, kind of on the heels of that, the Saturday before this coming Saturday, we're having our extravaganza. We have easily in excess of 150 kiddos signed up right now. We're going to have at least another 100 more signed up this week. But as usual, we just want to have all the volunteers in place to make this a fantastic event. Uh, so probably the easiest place to do that is in the Southwest Church app. There's a tab just saying volunteering for extravaganza. Click on that and see where you might be able to plug in this coming Saturday morning. And then very last piece before I kind of uh, hand things over to Mark bringing the message this morning is after the service, I uh, want to invite you to check out the prayer garden. Uh, just out here, we kind of have like a, a short journey through Easter week just to kind of go through, uh, read through just kind of what happens each day leading up to uh, Crucifixion Friday and Resurrection Sunday. So be sure to check out the prayer garden, just things we have set up there. Uh, just again, ease yourself into the Easter week. Uh, but uh, outside of that, again, take a look at all the things going on in the bulletin because we want you to be fully in the know, but outside of that, uh, just prepare yourself for God as Abba Father.
Andrew said that next Sunday is Easter Sunday, so just so you know, today is Palm Sunday. It's a, a special day that we celebrate. Uh, it's viewed as a day of celebration. A lot of churches end up having um, uh, palms uh, around, and they have the kids come up and do that kind of stuff. Uh, but it commemorates the time that Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And he was hailed by people. He was, he was praised as, uh, as the son of David. He was hailed as king. He was the one who was coming in the name of the Lord. And for the crowds that didn't have any idea of what was going to be taking place in the, in the days to come, it was a time of celebration. But for Jesus, for Jesus, it was a time of reckoning because he knew full well that everything that was going to take place within less than a week would lead to his arrest, to his beatings, to floggings, and to the horrible death on the cross. And a few days after his arrival in Jerusalem, Jesus found himself in, in the Garden of Gethsemane and was praying. And, and the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Luke that he just actually sweat drops of blood. It was that intense of a prayer time because he knew that death was just a few hours away. And in his humanity, because we need to understand that God, Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. He knows what it is that we feel when we face moments like that. He cried out to the Father. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus didn't pray this prayer just once. He prayed it three separate times. In his darkest moments, he turned to the one who could be with him through this time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, or chapter 2, verse 23, I believe, says that, that he entrusted himself to him who judges rightly, even though her insults were hurled against him. Jesus turned to his father. He turned to his dad. He turned to his Abba father. And there he found peace. He found strength. He found comfort. And he found calm in spite of the horrific storm that awaited him. And I share that event simply because of this vital truth that we need to go ahead and grasp and we need to wrestle with. We all have a need to have someone that we can turn to in life. When we have a problem, when we have a challenge, when life goes well and we need somebody to share it with, when we're lonely, when life seems to be falling apart, when we want to connect with someone that we're close with, someone who can help, someone who can we rely on and someone who can give us hope. So when life comes at you, who do you go to? Who do you go to? Because we need to understand the cultural and the historical background of what was taking place at this time because people did not know where to turn to back in those days. They, were, they saw people claim that God was the one to follow, but the way in which he was often portrayed seemed, made him seem distant, unreachable, impersonal, and uncaring. I'm sure the Pharisees meant well, but they, they ended up coming up with a self-righteousness that, that, that just kind of became a barrier for people to be able to relate to God. And they knew God, yes, as the great Yahweh, the great I Am that we've talked about. He, he, they knew him, God, as Elohim, the creator God. They knew about him as Adonai, which is master and Lord. They knew of him as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, or El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, and Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, or Jehovah Rohi, the Lord who is my shepherd. We've covered these names over the past several weeks, and they knew about him as that. But the reality was that for the past 400 years, they had not seen or heard from God. 
They had not seen him work for a long time. And those religious leaders that were flouting their righteousness were making it almost impossible for them to be able to reach out to God because they were saying to themselves, God is so distant, and and, and yet these guys seem to have it all together. How can a world, can I come close to God? He appears to be so silent. Maybe I'm not good enough. After all, I'm not as with it spiritually as these superheroes who appear to have it all together. You know, sometimes we end up coming into church and we see people up front doing their thing and say, well, I I, I could never measure up to that. I don't have it together like they do. Can we debunk that myth, please? Can we just debunk it? Because we're all sinners saved by grace, and we all need Jesus. But maybe in light of all that's happened in your life or in the lives of others, you find yourself at a point in your life where you wonder if God really cares. And deep down, even though you've heard that prayer is important, you wonder if prayer is really all that it's cracked up to be. Maybe you've prayed, but nothing happened. Maybe you asked for something that was pressing, for, that was important, that was life-threatening, and nothing. And deep down inside, you came in here, and you're still a little bit ticked, or at least a little bit disillusioned by God. And even though you pray, just as most Americans claim to do, deep down, you wonder, does it work? Is it worthwhile? I think that's where the people were back in the New Testament times. And then Jesus came along, and they saw something totally different. They noticed something special about him. They, they, they flocked to him because, because he, was, he was magnetic in his personality, And it wasn't just his personality, but he just exuded something that was peaceful and that they longed for deep in their lives. And his joy and his compassion and his zest for life, his genuine love and concern for people as well as his miracles and his teaching drew people so much so that they couldn't get enough of him because they sensed that he was really there for them. And one thing that people noticed about Jesus was that even though crowds demanded so much of his time, their approval was not what mattered most to him because to him, the approval of the Father mattered. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, we read that before meeting people, Jesus went off into a solitary place to pray. And there was also something radically different in his prayers. They reflected a connectedness with God that few had seen before. And those of us who who know a little bit about history and we know a little bit about the Bible, we say, "Well, well, he should be. After all, he's God, isn't he? But once again, I want to go back to the reality that we need to understand that Jesus was not only fully God, but he was also fully human. He's just like you and me. He struggled with the very same things that we do. Hebrews 4.15 reminds us that he was tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet managed not to sin. And he showed that we can connect with God in prayer, just as he did. And over the course of time, the disciples watched him, and they watched him go off into these prayer prayer moments and different things like that. And they finally approached him, and they said in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray. And what Jesus shared has been handed down through the ages. If you grew up in church, you probably memorized these words but I'd like for us to repeat it together, and uh, they're going to appear on the screen here. And will 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 you say that prayer with me? 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When Jesus taught this, he wasn't teaching a prayer to be memorized and just recited by rote and just to say a few words. But it was actually a guide for the content of our prayer. And some people have broken this down in a very simple simple acrostic called the ACTS acrostic, which stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And those are different categories that you can identify throughout that prayer. And it's useful for helping us to focus on these things that matter in our relationship with God. But there's one thing that 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 does not include. And it's something that happened as Jesus gave this prayer that caused people's jaws to drop because they had not heard it before. And it caused them to open their eyes wide And it was how Jesus started this prayer. It wasn't, oh, great and mighty God, or creator of the universe. He's all those things. Please don't misunderstand me. He is Jehovah. He is is God. But Jesus started out the prayer with our Father. Our Father. And the term that Jesus used in the Aramaic language that he spoke was likely the term Abba, which simply translates, translated means daddy. It's not only a term of endearment, but it's a term of relationship. It's a term of deep respect. It's a term of intimacy and love. And any of us, any of us who are parents, guys, let's be honest. When, when, when our kids come up to us, no matter how old they are, they come up to us and they say, hey, Dad. Or a three-year-old puts their arms up and says, Dad, Dad. Our hearts melt, don't they? They're incredible. It's so close and so personal. A number of years ago, a lady attended the church where I was serving. And through the course of several weeks, she's found herself hungering and thirsting after God and his word. She spent time in Bible studies. She came to church for worship. She opened the word maybe for the first time for her and, and, and she started going and developing deep relationships. And the time came for her to make the decision to surrender to Jesus and be baptized. And she approached me about that. And I remember almost as it were yes, yesterday, because this was several, several years ago, she stood in the baptistry and we were reminiscing or we, we were recalling what, what the meaning of baptism was. And she just had emotion just well up in her voice. She started sobbing. But with a smile on her face, with tears streaming down her eyes, she said, I'm going to have a daddy. I'm going to have a daddy. And that was a holy moment. When I mentioned the term daddy, Some of you in this room may react negatively to it because of the experience that you had with your fathers. Maybe you had an abusive dad or an absent dad or a passive dad or a controlling one or a selfish one. 
And the result is that you never receive the love, the affirmation, the acceptance, the confidence that dads are called to pass on to their children as they develop into adulthood. And if that describes you, I want you to know on behalf of all dads here that I'm sorry for any difficulty or possibly even horror that you've had to live through. Because just like God, good dads will love their kids and will seek to move heaven and earth to make what's best for them happen. And in the very best sense, God is our daddy. And the lady that I just mentioned, who celebrated her baptism many years ago, captured the impact of that truth. In order for a church to stay focused on its mission to make disciples into going into all the world, prayer is pivotal. And as you invite your family and friends to join you on Easter Sunday next week, I want you to know that prayer is pivotal. Whoever you're bringing with you, I want to encourage you to pray now that they will hear the hope and the victory of the resurrection of Jesus provides. And next Sunday, there are many people who are going to be gathering here at 7 a.m. on Sunday. I know that's too early for a lot of people to even think about, but uh, it, it's not even in your calendar. But people are going to gather to pray that God will move in people's lives through his spirit in such a way that they will choose to embrace the Lord Jesus as Savior and Lord and make the father their own daddy. As a matter of fact, that Sunday is also Baptism Sunday. And you're saying 7 a.m., is that early? Yeah. Is it inconvenient? A little. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Someone has said that, that, that you have to talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. Prayer is depending on your daddy. It's a reminder for us to trust him. It's a reminder, it's a reminder that our dad is so much greater than anyone could ever imagine. And we get to call him Jehovah Jireh. We get to call him Elohim. We get to call him all these things. But, but, but really when it comes right down to it, if we know him through Jesus Christ, he's our dad. And that makes all the difference in the world. And prayer is depending on our daddy. It's reminding us to trust in him. It's a calling out to him in thanksgiving, in anticipation, and even in desperation as we face opportunities, joys, heartaches, and challenges. Simon Mbevi, say that fast three times, is a pastor in Kenya. And he noted that in his country, in a sermon that he preached, People who live on the average of $2 a day call out daily to God out of a sense of real desperation. And as he has traveled to the United States, he says that so many in the church in America seem to have lost that sense of desperation and reliance on God because we have so, so much. We pray, but very few of us pray out of a sense of desperation. So often we tend to think of God as, as kind of an escape button or an emergency button or escape valve. And not a dad who's there for, uh, for us at all times for all things. It was in the garden hours before his crucifixion, that Jesus trusted his dad. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. And I have to tell you, I'm not there yet. 
after nearly 70 years on this planet because when it comes to knowing God as my dad, I still have so much to learn. This was brought home to me vividly a few years ago. As I happened to be studying this very, very passage and going through the Lord's Prayer, I was preparing for a series of messages for it. And uh, during that process, I was listening to some Christian music. Um, I had a tendency of doing that in my office at times. And uh, I did that that day. And the song that we just sang, Oceans, came on. And one section says, and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide where feet may fail And fear surrounds me. You've never failed. And you won't stop. Start now. As these words were sung, I was catapulted back in my mind to to a time in my childhood where I was learning how to swim. (laughs) And my dad knew that I wanted that, but he also wanted it for me as well. And so he'd take me out into water uh, on the Adriatic Sea. We lived over in Italy, you know. We lived right on the coast. So he'd take me out into the water. But he'd take me out into water that where, my, where I couldn't touch. It was over my head. And that alone scared me. And then he would lay me out flat on the water and put his hand underneath my stomach and he said, Mark, I've got you. Go ahead and swim. I've got you. And he reassured me that he would not let me go. But every single time I panicked. Each time I wanted to go back to the shore. Or if we were in the pool, I wanted to get out of the pool I wanted to get away from that. I never, as a result of that, overcame my fear of water, and I still struggle with that to this day. I never really learned to swim or tread water like most people can. And as I reflected back on it, I, I just wanted to be in control and handle things my way. So one day... After dad gave up on me, he said, okay, it's up to you. I went ahead and got my uh, uh, mask, my snorkel, (laughs) and I bravely set out on my own in 24 inches of water. And I paddled some, and I managed to stay on the water and everything. I got some basics down. I started making progress. I could move from one direction, in one, from, from one place to another and different things like that. And dad was over, up on the beach and I remember standing up and saying, hey dad, look at me. And I dove in and I did what I did before. And he smiled. But I remember a sadness in his smile because he knew that I was missing out on so much more. And as that moment hit me, as I was preparing for this series of messages, I found myself sobbing. I started crying because I sensed God saying to me, Mark, I've wanted so often to take you out into the deeper waters to teach you so much more of what it means to trust me, and yet you have chosen to stay behind at times and play it safe. Mark, will you trust me as your daddy? Because it's in the deepest waters that you will find out how much I care for you and how much I will hold you up. Since that time as a child, I can tell you that I've been through some deep waters. 
I've shared some of them with you uh, over the course of this uh, interim ministry. But I can't tell you how many times my heavenly daddy has reached out and helped, how he's been my guide and how he has moved heaven and earth to reach out to me. And I wish I had the time to go ahead and recall to you all the things that God has done to me and my family and the ministries that we've been privileged to serve in over the past 50 years. And I could tell you of times when needs were met unexpectedly, relationships were miraculously restored, lives were changed, people turned to Jesus, answers to prayer were deep, meaningful, dramatic, and faith-building. And yet since then, since those childhood days, there have also been times when I've refused to meet the Lord in the deeper waters because I was afraid or because I wanted to be in control. And in spite of that, my gracious and loving dad still invites me into deeper waters and he invites me to join him. He still gives me the opportunity to pour out my heart to him, to listen to him for his guidance, to follow him in those deeper waters, and he invites you and you and you and you as well. Prayer that connects begins with relationship. Our Abba, our Heavenly Father, our Daddy. And I don't know where you are. You may remember that it used to be that way, but something's changed. Or maybe you were invited to go into deeper water with him, but you chose to stay in the shallow part of the pool. Or maybe you got out of the water and you walked away and you feel so far from him. And you can't imagine how it would be that he, that he would even notice you, much less care for you. Or maybe you got, never got into the water in the first place, and even though you want to learn, you wonder if he really wants to listen to you. If you get nothing else out of this message, would you hear this? You matter to God. His love for you is white hot and passionate for you. And the cross of Jesus Christ that we will remember in a very special way this week leading up to the empty tomb is a reminder to the extent he would go to connect with you. He didn't simply move heaven and earth to reach you. He willingly died in your place, and he arose to prepare a place to, for you to be with him for eternity. And when you end up surrendering to Jesus, his spirit comes to live with inside of you as you are baptized, and he, it is your seal of adoption as, your, as his own child with all the rights and all the privileges and all the inheritance that comes with that position. And if you feel far from him, he wants you back. Maybe you're going through a season right now where everything seems different. Maybe your circumstances are more trying, your, your events more and more challenging. But even in those moments, we can rejoice in the fact that we have a God who wants, to know, wants us to know him, not as an impersonal entity, but as a loving, personal Abba Father, our dad. So as we close right now, I, wanna, I want us to go into a guided prayer time and a if you'll just take time to close your eyes and just focus on where you are with God. And I'm going to give you a few thoughts to present, to, to consider. 
and you can develop your prayer from that. So would you take the time right now to not only thank God for his awesome greatness and all the names that we just have looked at over the past few weeks, but also being grateful that he is a personal Abba Father. And now go ahead and take the time to thank God for being a welcoming father. No matter what, he loves you just as you are. And as you thank him for that, thank God also for being a restoring father. Because he may love you just as you are, but, but as a restoring father, he loves you too much to leave you that way. And he knows that the only way he can restore you is by your acceptance of Jesus as your Lord, your Savior, your soon coming King. God, thank you so much for being our daddy. Thank you that you reign on your throne in majesty. And yet, as you tell us in the book of Hebrews, we can boldly come into your presence, just like a child comes into the throne room of royalty, but they climb on the lap of a king, not because they're being disrespectful, but because that king is their dad. Thank you. And as people here are wrestling with with thoughts and decisions and questions, Lord, may you answer them through the power of your spirit, through the presence of Jesus, and through your loving invitation for anyone and everyone to come home to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. When darkness tries to hold over my bones, Sorrow comes to steal joy I own. When brokenness and pain and all I know, I won't be shaking. I won't be shaking. My fear, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Yeah. Shame no longer has a place to hide. 
for worshiping with us today. It's wonderful having you all here. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great week. <laughs>